or this code. Okay. Okay, assalamu alaikum one more time. And this is the second class, uh, second lecture in this class of uh, introduction to thinking. Uh, yesterday in the previous lecture, lecture one, we talked about uh, this uh, history of uh, the issue of thinking, how thinking was uh, perceived by different scholars, especially in the Muslim world. And for that in the Greek, uh, era, I did not talk about it, but uh, eventually it will come as we uh, discuss uh, various issues here. But, uh, and last time uh, we had this, the summary of Muslims definition. Uh, we mentioned that the uh, Muslim scholars, which we counted many of them, like Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, uh, Al-Muhtasibi, uh, Al-Juwaini, uh, Ja'far bin Qudama uh, and who else? Uh, Al-Razi and Al-Ghazali. Now, by the way, I just want to mention that uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, they did not arrive at the proper definition of what um, the mind is. Uh, however, uh, to say the least, they were able to produce a vast amount, very large amount of, or a wealth of knowledge uh, especially in the Ahkam Shara'i and the Shara, and they were absolutely good at it. Uh, but remember, they were uh, very much uh, uh, obligated within the boundaries uh, of Ahkam Shara'i, so they needed a specific uh, understanding. If, it, if the, the definition comes from the from the Hukum Shara'i, then definitely you will find, uh, uh, like Imam Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, Ahmed bin Hanbal, and the rest, they were absolutely superb and excellent at that. However, this issue, uh, which is not directly uh, uh, directly uh, emitted or produced from a particular dalil, although it can be produced from uh, from a collection of dalils from different uh, areas, as we will see how you can uh, uh, you can do that, but. Uh, the, uh, the bottom line is uh, they have come up uh, with whatever they have come up with. The closest they came up to is that it's an instinct, uh, which is, of course, instincts are different than, than mind. Instincts have the ability to distinguish between objects or between things, but only if it's related to instinct, as, I, as we will discuss uh, later, inshallah. Uh, okay. Now, uh, let me just, I want to do one uh, technical issue uh, before I proceed. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, uh, on the, uh, on the other side, other than the uh, Islamic scholars or the Muslims, what they have, they were able to come up with, let me talk about two attempts also, different types of attempts from uh, coming, coming from a different perspective altogether, uh, which is here. So there is a theory of mind, theory of what mind is, by two philosophers, uh, famous, well-known philosophers. One is Hegel and the other is Marx. Uh, both are Germans, uh, like Hegel, his uh, uh, philosophy of mind uh, was born in 1894 uh, and uh, he's from Germany. And Marx, who is the, uh, his main uh, book, he has several books, but one, the main one is called Capital, and Capital is the one that in which he, it's a really, it's a big encyclopedia and comes in six large volumes that talks about uh, all types of things about dialectic materialism, historic materialism, the uh, function of the mind and the, the way to derive ideas and to extract ideas. Very interesting. And those two they have this model, which I would call it the one is the reverse of the other. But 
uh, for historical uh, uh, reasons, we start with this one on the left hand side, which is the uh, Hegel, this model, because he lived before Marx and Marx came uh, around 100 years after, uh, after Hegel. So uh, Marx has actually borrowed this theory about the about mind uh, or what we call the aql or the reasoning facility. Uh, and he reversed that. So let me show how uh, uh, he did it. Let me uh, go into the next slide. This is what Hegel did. Uh, in his uh, work called The Theory of Mind, uh, and I call the Hegel fallacy. It's his, uh, his actually, uh, he has big, big uh, flaw in his model and big mistake. But anyway, for those who, who want to uh, familiarize themselves with these philosophers, Hegel is, uh, again, he's a German uh, philosopher born in 1770. Uh, died 1831. Uh, his uh, main themes were rationalism and absolute idealism. Now, idealism, by the way, is the opposite of materialism. Idealism is the opposite of materialism. Materialism is what Marx had composed and came up with the uh, communist theory or the communist ideology based on materialism. Uh, Hegel, he talked about idealism and so he is well known to be the father of idealism, which is the ideological base for origin of democracy and capitalism. Now, uh, although uh, democracy and capitalism, especially capitalism was uh, created, or at least the foundations of capitalism as an economic system was uh, uh, made by Adam Smith uh, almost uh, about 50 years before the before uh, Hegel, that's where Adam Smith was born in 1723. Uh, they, uh, between 1770, by the time Hegel was mature, uh, Adam Smith was already uh, out of this world. So, but nevertheless, uh, Hegel came with the idea of the, the, the uh, reasoning of idealism and idealism was based actually, was the whole theory or the whole ideology of idealism was based on his definition of what mind is. It's very interesting. See, that's why I kept saying the definition of mind to understand what mind is can actually produce a whole set of ideas and thoughts eventually it comes as an ideology. So here is what, uh, uh, Hegel says, in, 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 uh, in a nutshell, before I go into uh, graphs and uh, diagrams, what he says is that ideas and thoughts, they do exist in the brain somehow. And what the brain with his, with the thoughts uh, the brain has and the information and all the ideas, when he looks at reality outside, <clears throat> you will be able to explain the reality and pass judgment on them based on <clears throat> based on what he has in his brain. <clears throat> that's that's the basic the basic theme that he had. <clears throat> and later on, Marx claimed that this whole idea of idealism is that you have an ideal view of the world, and from this ideal view. You can explain things around. It. So, if the ideal view in your world, in, in your uh, in your own world, or in your own brain, or own brain, is that the uh, uh, world should shall have, or uh, or the world should have uh, uh, a very large wealth, then your brain is going to function in a manner that will produce wealth. Uh, in fact, some philosophers, the recent philosophers, they, uh, or even poets uh, like uh, Al Khayyam or like uh, uh, Jubran uh, from Lebanon, they used to say, if in your brain you have images of beauty, let's say you have a, a beautiful view in your brain, then you are going to see everything around you are beautiful. 
so that's the idea of idealism. Now, when he came, he wanted to explain that and prove it, he said, look, here is a matter, which is the object around me. That's the world around me. That's the trees, the mountains, the people, the uh, cars, the objects, all over me. And here is my brain. Now, what my brain will do will pass a reflection, will actually shed some type of, uh, of light from my brain into this matter. And then the feedback coming from the matter is going to reflect on my brain. And then I will have a thought. So his explanation of the mind, he says, this is the reflection of brain on a matter and the counter reflection that comes from matter to the brain, that's, that's what the mind is. That's the mental process. So what, now, the, the, the interesting thing here, which is the new thing, is, uh, is that uh, Hegel uh, was able to realize that mind, this concept of mind, includes the brain, but it's not the brain includes the objects around us, but it's not the object. Includes information that's in the brain, but it's not the information. It is this process of the ideas and information in the, in the brain being reflected here with this type of the green arrow, which I have being reflected in the matter. And then a feedback comes back from the matter to the brain. Now he did not talk about senses or he did not talk about uh, any other, uh, he did not explain how does the brain actually shed uh, light or uh, uh, radiate to the to the matter. He didn't even go there. Uh, uh, he assumed, and that's a big big uh, assumption because it, it doesn't have a proof. He assumed that the brain reflects whatever it has, as I just mentioned, points uh, 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 like Jibran Khalil. When they say woman, uh, uh, be uh, uh, a beautiful or have a beauty in your brain, you will see the world around you beautiful. Have uh, some dark images in your brain, then you will see everything is dark, which is not really true. That's not, uh, not really true. It's not the fact that uh, I have uh, uh, everything in my brain is bright and nice, therefore I see everything out as nice. And if, if I do so, then I would be misjudging because sometimes the one who comes uh, to me in a very uh, beautiful suit might have the gun under his suit and kill me. So then where is the beauty here? So uh, it doesn't take a brainer to realize that it, the truth of the matter that the brain does not radiate and does not reflect on objects and the objects do not reflect back. But even though this idea was, uh, is not sound, upon which this issue, of, upon, upon this idea, the idealism, where is this uh, found? Okay, here. This idealism was created and it became as an ideology. So that's why in the, in the West, Western mentality, which is based on the Hegel type of uh, theory, first, uh, uh, they create uh, an image of the wall. You would like to see that the world is uh, your colonies. And then you create uh, uh, the armies, you build all your uh, troops so that you can colonize the rest of the world. So this, is, this becomes an, uh, 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 an initial thought you, you, uh, they create, and then they go on and try to, uh, to build it. Uh, that's the whole idea of, uh, of Hegel about mind, which let me just do this here, okay. So that's his definition is uh, that the mind has uh, two major components, the brain and reality. And the, uh, the mind is the reflection, the reflection of ideas in the brain on the matter to generate new ideas. So that's how new ideas, uh, how new, new thoughts are generated. I use my own thought. My own thought uh, uh, sees a new object or a new matter or a new uh, 
uh, something uh, new reality with my original idea is uh, approaching the object a new idea is generated and this whole cycle is called the mind according to Hegel so in a, uh, the, it's a failed attempt, uh, as uh, I already mentioned. Why? Because the brain does not reflect nor radiates. It's uh, it's a fallacy. It's uh, it's an assumption which is not true, and of course did not include the necessity of information to explain the reality. He just uh, mentioned that the fact that my ideas uh, reflect on matter, and the matter with this reflection comes back a new thought. Now, he did not even talk about processing these ideas and how they get processed and where they get processed in order to generate ideas. So that's it's still very vague. In fact, if I go back to the Muslim scholars uh, whom we said their definition was not accurate, they were way beyond what they have, uh, uh, what they have said. Okay. Uh, I see that uh, brother Sheikh Mohammed is raising his hand. Do you want to say anything, brother, before I proceed? Uh, yeah, Sheikh, I have one question. Yeah, you said that uh, the in Hegel uh, theory, the person is having uh, some original uh, ideas, right? You are telling that it is a previous information yeah, is yeah. it the previous information? It is. It is previously in the, in the brain. He never said where it came from at the, at the very beginning. So he did not go as far as, because uh, previous information with the way he, now well, I think you are uh, uh, hitting on a point, says, okay, this is my brain. I have some uh, small pieces of ideas here uh, or information with these, this one here moves and hits an object, let's say, no, no not like this. I'll take this one. Okay, so this piece of information hits an object. This object now responds to the brain with a new idea. So this one generates a new idea. This is the, the new idea generated. Now, okay, he never said or thought it's important to explain where this first idea came from. There was a time at the very, very time, even if we, if we uh, go with, with him and Darwin, this Darwinism was big at that time. There was a time when uh, evolution took place, which we do not believe in evolution, but let's, let's assume for a second. Now, this first man on earth where did he get this first piece of information? He never uh, explained that or even touched on that because he assumed that humans by nature, they do have ideas and thoughts uh, uh, a prior. Uh, but that's his, the, the way he, uh, uh, he approached it. So he did not deny the, 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 the need for this uh, uh, information, the existence, but he did not show the correlation between objects and information, because I may have an, uh, uh, an information which is absolutely not related to this object. Let's say this object is, is a cow, and this is the first time I see a cow in my life. So how am I going to, uh, my idea which I hit the cow with and to get reflected so that I can uh, come to a conclusion that cow can be useful or cow can become a god to be worshipped like the Hindus or a cow can be useful for uh, cultivating the land. Uh, he, uh, uh, he could not explain that. He did not even touch that. And that's uh, part of the fallacy of his theory. So the, however, uh, despite this issue, here, if, uh, if my, uh, this red uh, box, if you can see that, let me move it somewhere here. So we can see it and let me increase the fonts a little bit. So the, uh, the impact is that reality is explained and understood based on previous mindset. Okay, so this is your previous mindset, according to him, will determine 
the new ideas. And that's very, very dangerous because that's what we call bias. And in uh, some of my uh, lectures, especially when I talk about the systems, econo economic system or economic justice, there is a lecture I had, economic justice in Islam, because uh, one of the main reasons of injustice is the previous bias that you may have. If I have a bias against color, against the blacks or whites or uh, uh, Indians or uh, Pakistanis or Arabs or Persians or Europeans, if that bias is there, then there is no way in the world I'm going to be just. In fact, I will be, I will be unjust and I will produce injustice the moment I start thinking about the issue because of my previous mindset. And according to Hegel and Hegel's theory, mindset or previous mindset is the main item that produces a new ideas or thoughts. So if I'm going to produce a new law, the thought is a law, could be a law, could be a rule, could be a judgment. So this law, is going to, uh, 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 to emanate or to come from my mindset. And that's the biggest impact his theory had on, on, the, uh, on the life of people. And that's no wonder why uh, under uh, idealism, which is the theory uh, brought by uh, Hegel, and uh, capitalistic theory in general, which was formulated, and democracy, which was formulated together with his ideas, they were all based on this issue of previous mindset is what generates new ideas by simply uh, uh, interacting with the... Uh, now, interacting, actually, I'm making it much more... Uh, uh, sounds better for him. He, he never said it's interact. He said it's a reflection. And uh, they were obsessed by the... Uh, the material of physics about the reflections and uh, diffractions of light. So they he used reflection the same as Marx, as I will explain in a second. Uh, so this is one. And the second one says, uh, which I already mentioned, generates biased conclusions. So that's the uh, natural outcome of, uh, or the impact that uh, Hegel had on society. So from his time on, from the, when the, the, the philosophy became so uh, uh, so important and carried by, by countries, by people who, who love that because it allows them to uh, determine the view of the world based on a previous mindset that they had. So and that's what, because today, if I want to uh, explain why there is a very large injustice in the world, what, where does this injustice come from? I said, look, uh, usually it comes from a bias. Where does the bias come from? It comes from the mindset. How do we, how did the world get into this mess? It's there. It's right here. This is your guy. This is our guy. This is the guy, the guy that who, who made all of this mess in the world. And uh, 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 he continues to be appreciated until today, all types of philosophers, they refer to the idealism of Hegel. Now, having said that, uh, almost less than 100 years later, in 1770, so this guy came 17, Hegel 1770. This is, oh, Marx. No, I think I'm, uh, I repeated the same time, this wrong. Marx came, uh, Marx came out at, oh, this guy, Hegel, what is it? Hegel came 1723. No, that's Adam Smith. I have a mistake here. Somebody probably can look, at, look up the, uh, in the Wikipedia, the time frame of Hegel and Marx. I think I have one of them is, I think the, uh, Hegel is correct, but Marx is, uh, uh, is wrong. So Karl Marx, who's also a German, who wrote his book Capital, and he's called the father of materialism vis-a-vis -vis idealism, which is the total opposite. Uh, and he's, he formed the ideological base for the origin of socialism and communism, which came into existence, in real existence in 1917 at the hand of the Russian Revolution 
led by Vladimir Lenin. Uh, he was influenced by uh, Frederick Engel, Engels, who is a British, his uh, friend, and by uh, Frederick Hegel, who is his predecessor. And now what Marx did, this, see, this is what I, I said. Marx took Hegel. So if I take, bring Hegel back here, his uh, diagram, and put it next to So he reversed the arrow. He said, look, the brain does not have information. And uh, he was very uh, systematic. He said, look, where would the brain get information? The brain, after all, is a material being. A human is a material being. And developed out of matter, developed out to uh, uh, iron, uh, eventually uh, came to a piece of life, and the life eventually developed some type of advanced life, then the advanced life developed a brain, a human with a brain, but this human brain does not have thoughts. So what uh, uh, Marx said, you don't need, you don't actu actually, you do not need previous information here to be able to produce new thoughts. All you need is an object. It's a material object. You need a mountain, uh, a river, uh, animal, whatever object, get this object reflected here, the brain has the capability, the capability of generating idea from the matter itself. And when he was, uh, he was asked the question, how could it be possible that the brain without previous information can uh, they generate or produce ideas from something that's absolutely dumb, which is uh, uh, clueless or brainless or thoughtless, like a mother, like an object, like a rock, a sky, a tree, an animal, a donkey, um, whatever. What he said then, he resorted to assumptions. He called them uh, thoughts, but they, they are really ass assumptions. What he said, let me, uh, to make this clear, I want to create this new slide together and, uh, and make this a little bit large. That's my object here. Uh, and let's call it any object, material object. Okay. And this material object, according to uh, your surprise or my surprise or anybody's surprise, he said, within the object, within matter, there are laws. So unlike Hegel, who was much smarter, he said, these laws or these, the mindset is in the brain because the brain, the nature of the brain is, it can be a, a repository or a, a database of ideas and thoughts and information, which in reality everybody feels. Uh, Marx said, no. The object or matter has laws within it, somehow embedded within the matter. There are laws. They're just like as if he's saying they're ideas. And so when these things get reflected to the brain here, this is my, not my brain, it's a brain. So when he says the reflection, which goes back from the object, this reflection includes these flows, includes something. In fact, he came up with this whole issue of uh, materialistic, uh, material, uh, di called dialect. Mat I started forgetting my uh, vocabulary, uh, which you call the, the uh, dialectic materialism uh, or historic materialism and dialectic materialism, the dialect. So the dialect of the materialism, he said within the matter itself, there are embedded laws when they get reflected to the brain, the brain now discovers these and starts, starts collecting these pieces uh, uh, of information now or uh, the laws, you convert them 
inside the brain into something new. And this is how new ideas start uh, uh, coming to the being generated. Uh, why this is not like this? Let me see. So this is a new different law or different idea. And let's say this comes from this guy. That's what the uh, Marx claim. Now, Marx claimed that all you need to know is really to understand the matter around you. If you understand what matter around you, you will be able to build a world that's consistent with materialism. That's why at some point he said, both of us, people and the matter are the same. Because even the ideas we have, even the ideas we have are nothing but the reflection of matter on the brain. So I said, yes, it's true that I have thoughts and the thoughts are different than the matter. The thought is something different. It's not the same. Thought or idea is not the matter. But the thought, he said, it's produced by the mere reflection of matter. And then he made a, a, a simple mathematical uh, equation. He said like this, it's matter, which, is, which comes from the plus reflection, plus brain, all of this is still matter. Why? Because matter is matter. It's an object, is a, uh, let me call it here object rather than matter. Object is material being. The reflection is a material process. The reflection, in fact, when he started talking about the reflection of light, reflection of light, eventually it's my electromagnetic waves, which are uh, uh, and energy. Uh, he started explaining through physics, energy, if you concentrate it enough, it becomes solid. Uh, so it becomes matter and matter and energy are convertible back uh, from one to another. So uh, object, is a matter, reflection is a matter, brain is a matter, material being, so the total is material being. So even the thought, in this case, let's say, is a thought equals the summation of these three things which are material being. So the thought eventually is a, a material being. And that's why he came with, to the conclusion that the origin of the world, all of the world, the origin is not the idea. Uh, against what Hegel was said, the origin is idea. Origin of the whole world is an idea, is a thought. And from the thought generated the material being. And Marx said no, uh, and that's where the impact here going back. What's his impact of this theory? The impact of this theory going down here, reality is explained and understood based on its own characteristics, the characteristics of matter itself. So I explain it. It allows me to explain it. It gives me hints. So as if the material in the matter and the object is absolutely smart or intelligent, which is not true. We know that it's not true. So that's, however, uh, he came up with these ideas. And based on that, he denied the existence of God because there is no need for God. In fact, what he claims he said the whole idea of religion is because people all the time have relied on God to be the origin of ideas and thoughts and messages. Without God, there are no messages. Without God, there is no information. That's what he said about people of religion. And then now he says, see, now I prove to you or I explain that you don't need a God who supplies information to be able to produce thoughts. And therefore, there is no need for this issue or this thing which is called a God. And that was uh, his biggest impact on the world at large, which resulted in a whole uh, uh, super state in the uh, starting uh, throughout the entire last century, the Soviet Union, which is called the godless state, a state that does not believe in God, that does not allow the belief in God, that rejects the belief in God, that does not 
accepted at all, and based on the fact that, or based on the uh, notion that there is no need for an external source of information. All you need is a matter and a reflection. Of course, we say, look, matter does not reflect on the brain. There is no reflection between matter and the brain. In order to get the object to the brain, you need to sense it, as we will see in, uh, in a second. You need a sen you need sensing organ. You have to see it. You have to hear it. You have to taste it. You have to uh, touch it. Uh, you have to smell it. That's how objects are transferred to the brain. So there is no matter of reflection. And this uh, uh, sensing, the senses themselves do not have any facility to explain what is in this matter. So if you are smelling the something for the first time, let's say the first time you have, you experience uh, a smell of, uh, uh, let, me, let me bring some very strange example, uh, uh, the, uh, a fire lit by radioactive material. We know a fire lit by wood, you can easily smell, you say, ah, there is a fire that's being generated or being uh, created through wood or uh, through uh, oak wood or through uh, palm tree wood. You can easily distinguish. You can distinguish. Now, the, the, your senses, if, if this is the first time you smell a fire lit by a radioactive material, by radiation, let's say, and you've never experienced that before, and assuming for a second that it's not a killing, it's not going to kill you the uh, radioactivity, uh, you cannot distinguish that. You just say there is a smell. What it is, uh, you don't know. You cannot explain that. You cannot say it's radioactive. You cannot say it's uh, uh, enriched uranium. You cannot say any of these things. It's, it's impossible. Even if you smell this for 100 years, it remains to you a pure smell. So it's so the matter does not contain characteristic of its own self, and the senses that bring the matter to the brain does not have the ability to uh, uh, to realize what type of smell or taste or uh, uh, object is this which you you come across for the first time. It is just transferring transfer the object to the brain through senses. So the whole issue of reflection is wrong. The whole issue of uh, rejecting the necessity of information is absolutely, absolutely un uh, unfounded. And uh, if you really want to challenge me on this, I can tell you, look, go back to Karl Marx, go back to all Marxist the theoreticians and try to look up all examples about proving that man can realize the reality of an object without having previous information, you will see that all these examples fall in one of two categories. One category is that they talk about an object and a human who existed way before what you can test. So there is no benchmark. So when you ask, let's apply this issue to existing people. They would reject that because uh, immediately the, the, the theory will fall. Or, or they will bring an example that has to do with the instinct according to the Muslim theoreticians. Because Mus that's what I said, Muslim theoreticians were much smarter than these two guys here because uh, with instincts, with instincts, there is a very large portion of objects and material being that can be easily distinguishable through the instincts. But that distinction is only related to the emotions that are generated by the instincts. Like let's say the fear. Fear is an emotion generated by the, uh, uh, the instinct of survival. If there is an object that, that, can, uh, uh, that can threaten your existence. So if, uh, uh, if, you, if I am approached with an object uh, or I see an object or something, an object hits me and it uh, poses a threat 
to my life or to my uh, comfort, then that emotion that's generated out of that uh, uh, action is going to be stored in my brain. And at any point of time, anything that's related to this type of emotion, I can, uh, I can distinguish it. So probably there is, I'm not sure, I, I cannot say what's the percentage, but very large percentage of issues can be explained simply by instincts uh, rather than by the uh, brain functionality. But the moment, the moment you come to an, a, a, an action where the instinct is not directly involved, uh, where absolutely thinking is necessary, you will, this theory will immediately uh, collapse. And that's why, so you'll find that Marx had always used examples that had to do with food or fear or uh, sexual relation, just like Sigmund Freud, who is one of those uh, 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 who come in the same category of Karl Marx and even Hegel, but uh, without this thing, uh, 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 making big differences between them. Uh, or going back to someone, let's say the first man that ever existed. Now, how do you know the first man that ever existed? Allah Azza wa Jal knows him and he told us about what happened. Allah Azza wa Jal told us the man that uh, uh, started this life in this earth, I gave him information. Now, whether you want to believe it or not, that's your story. But to according to my story, my version of the story, the man that started this whole issue of generations of life of people of humanity, who is Adam alayhi salam, that all began with him, Allah Azza wa Jal gave him uh, uh, the uh, uh, pieces of information to start with. So we, we, so we know, know, we know that according to us, at least for a fact, at least we have a way to explain things. Uh, Marx was running away. Uh, and I want to mention uh, a word by uh, uh, Sheikh Nabhani, who is uh, the author of the book I am using at Tafkir. When he was explaining Marx and his uh, theory, uh, he had a statement saying, uh, what really stopped Marx from coming to a correct conclusion about what mind is, is the fact that he insisted at the beginning of his thinking, before even arriving at thoughts, that there is no God. So he, he took this as a base. So he wanted to explain everything based on the fact, based on the, on the, on the idea that he has that God does not exist and there is no external source of information, and then the information and the, and the data and the ideas and the thoughts are created simply by the brain by interacting with the matter through the uh, process of reflection. So that's the, uh, uh, this idea of Marx. Okay, so these two issues, let me uh, stop for a second and see if I have uh, questions here uh, or comments. And then I will uh, probably the next, I will be talking about the reality of mind. What is mind in reality is and how we think about it and the proof for that. And we will definitely uh, base part of our proof. And well, let me uh, retract, take this back. Uh, we can extract our uh, definition and our understanding, we can base our understanding, we, we base it upon ideas and thoughts that we got from Islam, from the Quran and the Sunnah, because that's our foundation. We use that foundation and we can arrive at, at some conclusions. Uh, uh, and that's where we say in Islam, there are two things that can be based on the Aqeedah. One is something that's derived from Aqeedah, which are the Ahkam Sharia, the Islamic rules, and uh, uh, general concepts, which are Islamic, or it can be built upon, built upon the Aqeedah or the foundation, something that you can generate new ideas and thoughts, but you take it from the collection understand, collective understanding of the, of the Aqeedah. So I will stop right here for a second. Let me go and take some uh, uh, questions or comments. I know some brothers or sisters sent me some questions. I will see if we want to take them now or they want to uh, 
delayed them until I discussed the Islamic or our on uh, understanding of what mind is. Hello, uh, alaikum Sheikhi, just a question, uh, because you know, regarding Karl Marx, that he already made an assumption uh, that the Sheikh said, uh, Sheikh Taqi, that uh, there is no God. Yes. I mean, isn't that all already? Uh, he, he made a pre, uh, presumption, I mean, which is already incorrect, meaning based on a uh, previous idea. <laughs> I mean, he also needed some type of previous information, and then he yes. produced the thought. Fact- in fact, brother Muhammad, yeah. In fact, brother Muhammad, one of the biggest attacks that uh, Marx receives from uh, not necessarily from us, but even from the uh, idealists, the uh, Hegel philosophers, is that look, uh, you used an idea, as you just you are mentioning, the idea that uh, there is no God in this world and the world is material. And uh, based on that, you started this whole issue of set of theories and ideas. So you really uh, started with a mindset. So you did not come to, uh, to arrive at this conclusion with a, w- without a mindset, with absolutely a, a vacuum brain. You could not evacuate your brain totally from all the ideas and thoughts and then start from, uh, from zero. You did, you did not do that. Uh, you started with certain ideas and you used them. You used this. Uh, you used this pre-set idea about there is no God, and that's why he continued whenever you would argue with a Marxist. Because I, I spent six years in, in in that type of the world during the peak of Marxism. Uh, the moment you start uh, proving that the previous information is a necessity, then immediately they take you and they jump, that ah, that means it will prove that there is a God, but there is no God. So th- that's their conclusion. So they stop the whole argument is that if this will take me to the point that to, to realize and to believe that there is a God behind this world, then I don't want that because it's absolutely rejected. So that's the mindset they had. And they used to say, look, you are coming from a uh, well-framed idea. I said, well, let's talk from zero. Just take from zero. Uh, a person who does not have ideas at all, as I just uh, gave an example, even if it has to do with an instinct. Uh, I remember Sheikh Nabhani's very good example. Uh, there is an instrument which uh, old farmers in uh, our countries, all of them, which, which is based on kerosene, which you use this small stove to generate small fire to cook food. It's, it's a cooker uh, on kerosene. Uh, and usually it's used to make coffee. So somebody was asking Sheikh Nabhani uh, whether he had this stove or not. He said, yes, I do. Then they asked him, why don't you make us some coffee or tea on this? He said, I don't know how to do that, how to operate it. Then the guy was making a joke. He said, look, you are going to change the world and build a khilafah and a state and, 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 and you don't even know how to operate this small, we call it babur. Babur, this is the, the cook. He said, look, this requires previous information. I have lots of information, but on this particular issue, I don't have information to be able to operate this uh, dummy thing. So it doesn't matter how much information you have, but if you don't have information related to the object you are thinking about, you will not produce a thought. Okay, I think there was uh, another hand was raised and I... Uh, oh, here, uh, Sophia, she wrote that, according to Karl Marx, does the dialect of materialism means the laws embedded within matter? Yes, exactly. Exactly, that's exactly what dialect materialism mean. He said, material beings, each and every one of material being has some type of laws, embedded laws. And when these two material beings come in interaction, that's what he called the dialect. 
So there becomes a new formulation of material being. And when you when you ask him where did the idea go, but he said he says the idea is also a material being, and that's why he insisted that uh, the thought thought is a product of matter, pure. There is nothing but matter that produces the idea. So that's where the dialectic materialism comes in that matter interacts with itself. Even when we as people interact with, let's say, the ocean in order to create out of the ocean artificial waves in order to make some artificial tsunami and in order to overflow a certain uh, beach or something. I'm just making examples right on the, uh, 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 on the fly. Even if we are doing that, I as a, a human, I as Abu Talha interacting, which is a material being, interacting with the ocean, which is material being, and we are producing something new, which is also a material being. That's what he called dialectic materialism. And all of that is, again, he wants to explain things without the need of external messages or the issue of messengers or ideologies, which yeah, which use God as part of the ideologies. That was already a pretext. And according to the Hegel theoreticians, he was already using a mindset which he refused to accept from Hegel. Uh, no, thought is not an action. Somebody is asking, is thought an action? No, thought is not an action. Uh, a thought is a product of thinking. And thought can lead to an action, can control your behavior to do an action, or may not even impact you, as we will see when we say, when you generate, when, when thoughts are developed into concepts, then those concepts can lead to a behavior, whether a positive or negative behavior. But thought is not an action, no. And, but thinking is a process. It's not an action, it's a process. Uh, and and that's when I when I will be talking next next time about how do we perceive thinking, uh, how do we define mind? Because sometimes some people are waiting for me or someone else to provide the definition in one word or one sentence. Look, definitions, especially terminology definitions, sometimes can be a sentence. Like for example, look at the definition: of what is hukum shari? What is a law? A law is not simply a word. A law is the, is, is the manifestation of an order which has an authority over the people who perceive that law. So it's a whole statement. It has many components. What is a hukum shari? Hukum shari, we call it in Arabic, in, uh, according to, to, our, to scholars, uh, Muslim, it is the uh, address or the speech of the legislator, which is related to the actions of the servants. See how many pieces, each and every piece here of the statement has its place in the definition. So it's a speech. It's something, it's not assumed. It's khitab. So you cannot say, I assume or I think it comes to my mind that Allah wants me to do that. Like some people say, you know, I woke up and I, I really feel that Allah wants me to, to stay home today, not to go outside. That's not hukum shari, that's not khitab. It's not khitab. It's not an address. It's not a statement. So khitab is a part of the definition. The khitab or the speech of whom? The legislator. So that's, so the speech of the scientist, the scholar, is not hukum shari. Or the speech of the prophet Muhammad as a, as, as a person is not hukum shari. But as a messenger receiving khitab from Allah Azza wa Jal, it is hukum. Or it's part of a hukum. And it has to be related to actions and the actions of people. It's not the actions of jinn or malaika or uh, animals or trees. So, so a definition can be a statement. So today or tomorrow when we, uh, next time when we start talking about the definition of 
thought or, or, or mind in Islam will say it is, it is a process. It's a process by which a material object is transferred to the brain via the senses, sensing organs, and correlated to a previous information in the brain in order to generate a judgment or a verdict on the object. So it's not a matter, it's not only a material being, it's not the transfer through the senses, it's not the information that's in the brain, it's not the brain itself, it is this whole issue of the transfer of an object via the senses, because uh, you'll tell me why it has to be the senses. I said, well, if you are transferring an object to me, which no one had seen it, no one had heard it, no one had touched it, you are just telling me there is an object in the sky that looks like something like an apple. What is it? Give me an image, give me a sound, give me a, a color, give me a taste, give me, give me something that I can uh, relate to. Otherwise, it's not a material object that is that can be applicable to the thought. So it has so the components of thought, and I will just make one sl slide, and uh, uh, I leave it for next time. Okay, not here. Ah. Yeah, so I'll make this, see this whole thing here, which I will be explaining next time, I will be going through this. There is a brain in the middle. There is an information inside the brain. So there is something, there are objects around and there are sensing organs that would carry this object, transfer it to the brain. And with these red lines here, there is a correlation that happens between the information and that piece of object. All of this will provide us the base for a definition, which we will now eventually will see that everything that was spoken before us, whether it's through the instinct, feelings, emotions uh, involved, whether it's the objects, whether it's the reflection, which they called it, or information that is a previous mindset, all of this can be uh, uh, put together and come up with a, a very solid conclusion of what mind is. And that's, I'm not going to go on the details now, I don't have time for that, but that will be the subject of our uh, uh, next uh, lecture, inshallah. Uh, and let's see if we have other questions here. Uh, there is a question here by Abu Yusuf. There is a lot of discussion about thinking among many enlightened thinkers uh, like Kant. Uh, should we not consider their studies in the subject? Uh, actually, uh, first, uh, uh, before I pass a judgment on enlightened thinkers, all of these terms need to be defined. And uh, later on, I will define what's enlightened thinking and who is the enlightened thinkers. At the time of Kant or Hegel or Marx, enlightenment was not there at all. There is a word called enlightened. Now enlightened, they used to, to give this term to people who were thinking outside the box because inside the box there, there it was the church. If you are thinking outside the box of the church, you are enlightened, but that's not, it's not even a definition. It's not a reality. It's not something that you can prove or disprove. It's just a word. So, uh, and the, and the uh, Kent and Nietzsche and the others, all of them, when it comes to the thoughts, they can be summed up in either the uh, Hegel who has probably summarized all of these before and later on Marx who had reversed. It. Uh, and there is nothing really uh, truly uh, significant to take into consideration. Uh, for example, what Kent uh, started uh, saying that if you really uh, want to know whether you are thinking uh, uh, or not, you have to be able to doubt what you see. So the doubt, he considered doubting, 
which is re rejection as a base. Now, that in effect, in effect, he was trying to reject the previous mindset. But even a doubt itself is a mindset. So he was trying to, to go beyond what's called, oh, I'm not biased on any, I, I, I'm going to doubt you at the very beginning. I, I'm going to doubt everything in my mind so I can approach things uh, more freely. But that, because the word doubt is passing a judgment. Word doubt is passing a judgment. It's not simple rejection or evacuation. Because I mentioned, the, remember I mentioned the word, Marx could not evacuate his brain in order to come up uh, uh, to a new ideas. Uh, Kent said you don't have to evacuate your brain, you can just doubt whatever you have in your brain. Once you say you doubt your brain, you already passed a judgment. And therefore you continue to have a mindset. But that it's very, this scope of philosophies is huge. In fact, most of the philosophies in the world, starting from the Greeks until today, they will always, always come to this point about the mind. And that's why it's puzzling. It, it was put in a puzzling manner. So everybody at any point of time will have something to say about it. So we need to put this behind us and start using it. Inshallah, we will do that uh, 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 next time to start doing that. Uh, someone is asking, uh, is uh, ijtihad khitab? No, ijtihad is not khitab. Ijtihad is a derivation based on khitab, Brother Shiraz. The khitab, khitab is the address. It's the, oh, uh, no, let me take this back. Uh, I'm sorry. Khitab in itself, if it's not associated with a shara, with the legislator, khitab is a khitab. Now my talk is a khitab. I'm making khitab to you. And if you are asking me a question, that's a khitab. A khitab is an address. It's a verbal sound address. That's the word khitab comes. It has to be uh, visible, uh, audible, uh, well-defined. That's a khitab. It doesn't matter. The ijtihad is a khitab of the mujtahid. The uh, speech of Biden is a khitab by the president. The speech of the Khatib Jum'a on the day on, on the Jum'a day is a khitab. That's why we call it khutbah. Khitab in general, but once you define it or you attach some uh, connotation to it, it becomes khitab of what? Now, let's see, we have someone. Uh, I hear Sheikh Taqi used to say philosophy is baseless thinking. Well, not really, it's not what uh, uh, what Sheikh Taqi, uh, when he talked about the philosophy, he said the majority of philosophy that was accumulated over the years used, used the style of logic, the logic in order to arrive at new thoughts. And logic, logic is one of the styles, one of the uh, techniques of generating uh, ideas, but this technique cannot be trusted because depending on who is using the logic, you can reverse the same idea, the same fact by the same foundations, by the same premise. So he had his, uh, uh, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the style of logic, that why the logic is not, an, uh, uh, is not a safe, technique to use in thinking for building solid uh, ideas. But it's not rejected altogether. You cannot be against logic. Logic is a means uh, of deriving thoughts using uh, primitives. If your primitives are, are correct, if your uh, detection from the uh, primitives is valid, then uh, uh, your thought could be, could be valid as well if you, if you did it correct. Yes, Brother Taha. Salaam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Just a question on the issue of uh, previous information, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Related, uh, related, 
to both related to both uh, Marx and Hegel. So when um, Hegel is saying that the brain reflects onto the matter, but Marx said the opposite, that the matter reflects onto the brain. Yes. Did they define this to be the brain or the, the brain generating information or utilizing previous information to generate the new thought? Hegel, Hegel uh, he, what he stated is that the brain has information previous and this information gets reflected on the matter and with this reflection, with this reflection, a new idea is generated. Now, he did not go into detail saying once that interaction happens, uh, what happens, how, how it happens. He didn't care about that, but uh, many other philosophers did after him. And they started talking about the neurons, the neurotechnology, especially these days, and the, how the brain starts acting. But uh the the point that uh, hegel missed very 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 big is that the how does the brain reflect on a particular matter on what basis let's say if i see uh, a car uh, how does my brain uh, reflect on that car with a piece of information information that's related to the car it may reflect on that car with a piece of information that has to do with uh, enemies. And therefore, the, the idea that's going to be generated, it has to do with taking a, a, a position to defend yourself against a vehicle coming. Now, uh, the, that issue was what we call the attribute of connectivity that the brain has uh, and which is uh, uh, which this attribute needs to be uh, needs to be used on purpose it cannot be used haphazard it's not the fact that i look and see you and i know you uh, brother uh, hanif taha or taha hanif i know you uh, uh, and therefore once i see you I will go and start greeting you or I will do some uh, walk away from you. There has to be something else besides that. It's not enough to reflect and uh, point uh, my brain to you. So those, the relation, the correlation between the object and the information in the brain was absolutely absent in the definition of mind uh, based on Hegel. Okay, so there are question here. There are things that we can't fully understand through thinking alone. Well, I will talk about these things which uh, which are not thinkables or which you cannot arrive at conclusions when we when we talk about this uh, in front of me this uh, slide here. What does it take to provide a thought? And you will we will immediately identify issues which are beyond thinking issues which are not beyond thinking, thinking, but cannot arrive at conclusion based on our understanding of the mind. This will be absolutely cl uh, clear. But keep the question, remind me next time so we can answer it here. I don't want to jump ahead. So the denial of God is not a conclusion to which Marx came. No, it's not a conclusion, it's a premise. Unfortunately, or, or, for, or for, I, I don't have to be biased here. That's how it is. It was, it was a premise, and that's why he, whenever, whenever uh, his the Marxists uh, are cornered, they would immediately jump to this issue. Oh, uh, this means that uh, you have to admit that there is a God, and that's that defies the whole theory of Marxism. So they will, uh, they, they they take this as their final defense, which is. Absolutely no. So uh, no matter how, how much you arrive at the conclusion that there is a God, they will always uh, deny that. Now, what they say, which is, I think it's a, it's a very powerful mechanism, let's say, with the absence of God in the equation, we are able to explain the development of history and the development of man and the development of life. 
We can explain that. And we can detect the laws of the universe and apply them to the human. And that's where the, the move from the dialectic materialism to the historic materialism, which is really, it's amazing, amazing type of philosophy that was able to do that. Uh, uh, it's incorrect because it's, it's the, the base of it is incorrect, but it's not uh, simple to shuffle aside, shovel aside and say, just ignore it. No, it's, it's a very sophisticated one. And that's what, uh, if anybody had the chance to, to spend or waste some time on the capital and to see how dialectic materialism and historic materialism, dialectic materialism had to do with matter itself. Historic materialism had to do with the materialistic life of the people and how it evolves or develops uh, like the dialectic materialism. Oh, how it came? Uh, well, uh, by the way, uh, Hegel uh, theory did not become a base of capitalism because Adam Smith uh, lived and, and wrote his book, The Wealth of Nations, about capitalism from pure capitalistic uh, financial economic uh, uh, matter. When Hegel came in, uh, came, uh, came uh, after that, and he put the idea of idealism now, idealism uh, helped explain the concept of democracy and civil state uh, and explaining the world around you based on what you, uh, uh, what you think or perceive, okay? Uh, then those were coupled, and that's why even we, we say this ideology of separation and of church and state produced these two uh, gigantic uh, uh, ideologies, the political, uh, ideological, political, and the ideological uh, economic. So they were coupled uh, after Hegel ca came in. Then later on, philosophers, they took these two and they started supporting one uh, another with them. Uh, okay, I think, uh, brothers, I need to stop right here because brother uh, Faizan from Canada is uh, calling me. We have, I have to go. We're continuing the series of tafsir on Surah Al-Najm tonight. So I have to uh, stop here and move to the uh, next lecture. Uh, if you uh, want to, anyone who wants to join, please uh, do so. I think you can find uh, the, the link to listen to it on uh, our page, Quran as revealed. I'm pretty sure many of you know that. So I will be uh, going there. And next uh, Saturday, uh, we will start digging deep into our thoughts. So we have, I'm not, we spent these two lectures to show what is not thinking. And now we have to say what is thinking, what is the mind. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Brothers, sisters, jazakumullah khair. Thank you. And please, if you want to see the uh, video of yesterday's lecture, it's already on the, on the uh, website. I sent the link, which is called cctinc.elearning. Uh, there is an introduction to thinking course. And tonight's lecture will also go there. And we will be posting with the videos questions. And please, 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 if you go there, answer the questions. It's a good exercise to show that we really know what we uh, 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 what we are absorbing or what we are not absorbing. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam.